Hello everyone, this is the Lecture 2B for Week 2 of Marketing Research. In this lecture I'm going to talk about primary data and secondary data and when and how you use secondary data as part of a research project. In your textbook, if you want to read along, I'm looking at Chapter 3. So in this lecture, we, address, we are moving on from le learning outcome one to address learning outcome two, which is choosing the methodologies to acquire evidence in, in an ethical manner to address the marketing problem. In order to choose methodologies, we are looking at our choice of data and what secondary data can provide in terms of addressing the marketing problem. If the research problem can be answered using secondary data, then no other methodologies are required. So in terms of what I'm going to cover, I'm going to look at the value of secondary data, some of the secondary research designs, advantages and limitations of using secondary data, some internal versus external secondary data sources, and the internet as a growing source of secondary data. So the difference between secondary and primary data is essentially the purpose for which the data was created. So primary data is created to address a specific purpose. So you make the data or you find the data and you find the information for that purpose. Or a secondary data is created for some other purpose. It could be a media article where it's talking about customers experiences of Starbucks, for example. Or it could be internal financial reports about the amount of sales that have occurred in the last three months. So there were, there were both of these, one was made for general information for the population, whereas the second is an internal data source made to report the performance of the company but may be useful in solving a research problem in the in that it, a customer sales data can tell us what it, what are the trends in in customer data or customer experiences or customer sales so when looking at secondary data the question to ask yourself is does useful information or data exist already? And can that secondary data be used to address the research problem and answer related research questions? So last week I asked you to decide on what topics you were going to search for when looking for secondary data, both academic literature and other secondary sources. This is what we would call a research design. You have designed or targeted your research for secondary information in a specific way. This week what we're going to look at is whether that secondary data you collected can address the research problem, answer the research questions, or is it simply there to clarify the context or the situation in which the client finds itself, or clarify the problem area in certain ways. So the scope of secondary data. So this is the same as any other kind of re marketing research process. So we need to identify and clarify the information needs. So this is what I got you to do at the end of last week. You had to identify key areas that you, you wanted to look for. You need to define the research problem and questions. So we, in general terms so far, have defined the research problem, but this needs further clarification. And we are yet to develop our research questions. This will come. You need to specify the research objectives and confirm the information value. So for what purpose are we doing this research? Is it just because we need a, a quick decision and secondary sources are the quickest quickest available information 
And if it is the quickest, does the first information that comes across your desk if it's the most valuable to you? Or is there more detail that is required? Is this such a big decision that secondary data needs to be evaluated more carefully as to the quality and the credibility of the information? So you need to determine whether the secondary data can be used to answer the research questions. So just because it came up on a Google search doesn't mean that it's necessarily useful. Google is not always right. Google comes back with lots and lots of hits, but it's up to you to determine what of that search is actually relevant to what you need to find out. So just be aware that secondary data has this cyclical or reiterative role in the research problem definition. So the client brief forms part of a secondary source. It was, cre it was created for a particular purpose, but we need to use it in order to define what the research problem and research questions are. So we take that research brief and we've sort of developed a fuzzy scope of the, pro of the research problem. Then we, we come up with some research questions at this stage what topics are relevant. So we've created a list of topics we think may be relevant. What context issues may be relevant? We've come up with a list of possible context issues that we need to have information for. So we go to the secondary data, we collect it, we analyze it, and from that we then clarify more specifically what is the research problem, what are the research questions. And if we still need further clarity, we can go back to the secondary data again. And in this cyclical process, there comes a point where we think we have addressed everything. If we've answered all the research questions, we can stop there. However, if there are still research questions to be answered, then we need to leave this cycle and enter the primary data sphere of collecting new information for the specific purpose of addressing the research questions. So in terms of the scoping of the secondary data, so it's historical. So if you want to look into the future, secondary data can only provide you with a picture of the past. And yes, we can extrapolate from the past into the future, but like with all prediction, it is a bit of a crystal ball and the accuracy of your past data will determine the accuracy of your future predictions. So this secondary data is available in many different forms. Some of the increasingly used and popular forms of secondary data, it's, this is forming part of what is known as big data, are these analytics that are being provided by the internet and social media companies. So you can look at Google Analytics. You, there is a certificate that you can do as a Google analyst and that you can put that in your resume. And it's a, a way of looking at internet data and driving internet traffic towards companies' websites. Similarly, Facebook Analytics, Twitter Analytics, um, Instagram analytics, all of these social media companies provide analytics which allow marketers to look at social media users' behaviors and the effectiveness of their marketing social media strategies. A, a bit more old school, we have co consumer insight companies. So for example, Nielsen is one. These are companies that Essentially, they spend all of their, ni their life analyzing consumers. So they do product category and anal analysis. They will look, track the number of sales. They will track advertising. They will track media usage. So they track over a long period of time a lot of information about consumer behavior. And for a very large fee, you can pay them for one of these reports. Companies 
can also gather their own internal secondary data or they can use previously collected primary data. So we tend to call these systems of internal data customer relationship management systems. So companies can track how many sales of particular products are made each day. They can also incorporate data about customer satisfaction surveys within that data. They can look at forecasting of future sales because they have a his their historical sales records. And finally, more generally, there are databases of market information. So Euromonitor is one, it's available through the library here at ANU. I suggest that it is a good point of information to start with because it does a global marketing index of different product types, pr different product categories, and often outside of the data it collects, it also does report reporting into a number of different areas. So these can be quite insightful and helpful to look at new product category markets that you might not be familiar with. So to give you an example of what the social media or internet analytics sites can provide you. So last year Pornhub released a bunch of analytics from it, traffic to its website. So, so Pornhub tracked its usage during different events in the world. And in this case, they um, it's looking at Game of Thrones in, insights. So every time this chart is showing the drop in traffic during the season seven Game of Thrones premiere. So the first episode of season seven, Pornhub's traffic dropped by nearly 5%. And as soon as the, the show finished, the traffic increased to more than average. Similarly, they tracked the drop in Pornhub traffic over the entire season of Game of Thrones, season six. And as you see, the first episode, for some reason, episode four, and the concluding episode had the biggest drops in Pornhub traffic because it seems by correlation that traffic was, that internet traffic was people watching the Game of Thrones. Other world events happening around this time, they also analysed the traffic to their website during James Comey, the, fo the former head of F the FBI in the US, when he testified to the Senate in June 2007. The, this is for Washington DC, so everyone really interested in politics. The Pornhub traffic in Washington DC dropped by 10% during that Senate hearing. So by correlation, the assumption is that that traffic was viewing to James Comey's testimony. Similarly, Jeff Sessions also testifying towards the Senate. Jeff Sessions is the, the what is he, he's the head of the Justice Department in the US. So he's, he uh, testified to the Senate as well and Again, Washington DC stopped watching Pornhub, it seems, and started watching Jeff Sessions' testimony. And finally, we have the NBA Finals game five. So the traffic changes during the uh, game and also by who was winning at the time of the game versus where people were living. So this kind of analytics can get quite detailed. So as you see the red line, which is the Cleveland area. So these are people who we assume are supporting the Cleveland Cavaliers. So at the start of the game, they've all left Pornhub, assuming they're watching the basketball game. But about halfway through, it seems that the Golden State Warriors were winning the game, 
So you see this increase in traffic back towards Pornhub and it seems that at the end of the game many people in the Cleveland area needed to be put in a better mood so the traffic back towards Pornhub increases dramatically from that area. And we see this with the Super Bowl. During the Super Bowl, a lot of football lovers are watching, uh, can't, uh, are leaving Pornhub in order to watch the football. And it's broken down by where people are living as well. So, Pornhub, I know it's, it's a bit controversial, but what can this data tell us? Well, it can tell Pornhub what other media interests that people have. So it can tell them if they're on their Pornhub users also seem to be Game of Thrones watchers, but they but they seem to be bigger basketball and football watchers. So they might want to advertise more specifically or in during media showings of those particular sports and possibly Game of Thrones as well. So this tells Pornhub something about its customers. But it also tells them people in different locations and the crossovers with their other interests. So they can more specifically target locations and interests to more effectively market to those people. Is the data relevant to the time period and population of interest? Well, the data is may or may not be, be relevant for all time. So this data is taken from 2017. Game of Thrones has one more season to go, but after Game of Thrones finishes, this data no longer is relevant. Whereas the basketball and the Super Bowl, these are our sports that happen yearly, so we assume that every year Pornhub will see a similar pattern in user behaviour. So is the unit of measurement comparable to the current situation? Well this Pornhub can't get to individual level analysis. They can only monitor traffic at, at, a, at a group level and by IP address. So if they want to make individual insights from this data, it's the wrong unit of measurement. Can the original source of the data be accessed? Well, Pornhub can access it because it's in their internal data. But if you're a marketer looking at this Pornhub analytics data, you can't access that original data. So you cannot be sure of the accuracy and the reliability of Pornhub's analysis. Are data acquisition costs reasonable? Well, in this case, Pornhub put this on the internet for free, whereas something like a report from AC Nielsen, the consumer insight company, can start at 10,000 and increase from there. Can data bias be assessed? That depends on the company producing the data. So Nielsen is very careful in producing reports that have an appendix that details the data collection procedures, analysis procedures, and the reliability and validity checks that it does on its data. So therefore, as someone buying one of these reports, you can be more sure that the data is accurate. Can data collection accuracy be verified? Well, that's a tricky question because sources of these data, data tend to be closely guarded because information is power. If accuracy cannot be verified, should the data be used? So should we use the Pornhub data? It was free, but we don't know how it was collected. We don't know how it was analyzed. The question we have to ask ourselves is, do we trust Pornhub? And that is a personal judgment rather than a verifiable measurement of the validity of that data. 
So in terms of our secondary research designs, we have two broad areas in which data can be accessed. We have literature reviews and electronic searches. You can go to a library, but the electronic searches have tended to supersede the old school in paper kind of searches. So electronic search sources, you can do both your academic literature and your secondary sources through electronic means these days by and large. So secondary sources include popular and industry articles and newspapers. So the electronic source of these, the best ones are available through the databases in the library. So Factiva is a global database of media outlets. It also includes some industry articles or industry publications, but Abbey Inform tends to be better for that kind of information. So if you wanted to find out articles in the New York Times, for example, Factiva lists all the articles from the New York Times up until a certain time lag. There is a time lag there though. If industry publications, for example, there are specialist brewing and uh, beer magazines and uh, magazines that are published that may be available through Abbey Inform. I've already mentioned industry data and the Euromonitor GMID database that is available through the library. Legal issues that you might be facing because not all marketing needs to fall within the legal um, world and LexisNexis is a good database for that kind of information search engines which include Google and there's online blogs. So we have opinion leaders that have blogs. We have also consumer forums. So when people really love a particular product, they often join things like Facebook groups or other more old school online forums to discuss that product. And this data of people talking about a product does fall into a secondary source. But just be aware, it does tend to be people who are more highly involved in the product category, so may not be representative of all users. So when it comes to the scholar, scholarly research, so we look, this is defined as peer reviewed scholarly articles. So there's library databases that specialize in this. So ProQuest, Make sure you click peer reviewed on your search there and also web of science. Google also has its own academic source, which is called Google Scholar. Use this with care because the best, the, the top results in Google Scholar are often not necessarily the most credible or most important research in a particular area. Having said that, not all academia is of equal value. There is an increasing rise in what we call predatory publications. And these are publications that will publish your research if you pay them to. So it's not peer reviewed and there can be some a lot of rubbish out there. So a good rule of thumb is to check the number of times a uh, a article has been cited. So this will be part of the information that the database or Google Scholar shows for each um, source. And look at when it was versus when it was published. I mean, if something has only been published in the last couple of years, it hasn't been the hasn't had the opportunity to be cited very often. However, if it was published 20 years ago, and only one person has ever cited it, it's probably not the most important publication or academic article in an area. So the literature review provides a comprehensive critical, that's a key word here, it's in all caps, critical examination of available information related to the research topic. So this is a very important step to unveil your new insights to a topic and in order to develop what we call the conceptual framework of thinking behind the research. So this 
allows us to look at findings of how should we do collect our findings and also what findings are important. So where are the gaps is always an important question when looking at the literature because it's in the gaps of what, what the current literature does not tell us that we find the reason for needing to go collect primary data. If you find that there are no gaps, there is no reason to collect primary data. So a comprehensive examination of available information related to the research topic. So here I'm going to do a short lesson on library databases. So this link takes us to the e-resources and databases on the main page of the library site. You'll see something that looks very similar to this. So I'm going to just use ProQuest today. So I click on P, ProQuest, ProQuest, there we go, 24. So ProQuest lets me sort by the type of source that the information is coming from. So I'm more interested in scholarly journals today and I can then specify that they're peer reviewed and because I'm lazy I'm also going to specify that they are full text. So in terms of the topic I think consumer commitment might be an important one to my my research problem so consumer commitment and enter and it's being slow all right so here we have the list of publications that fit my search criteria ProQuest also gives you a background to the search as well. You can see that consumer commitment only became a really a topic that was published about in the 1980s. Before that, there wasn't much written about consumer commitment until this decade where we have 55,000 academic articles that meet the criteria of consumer commitment. So. When you look at the search results, it highlights the search terms that have been used and you'll notice that it is pulling up articles that have consumer or commitment anywhere in the title or in the article. This means that you will get a lot of false positives. If I wanted to be more specific, I go back up to my search term and I put it in quotation marks and I rerun my search. And now you'll see that it only looks at consumer commitment when they are that specific term is used. Again, we have the same information. If I'm looking for consumer commitment, again, really it was only started to be looked at in any, any depth in the 1990s. But we have much fewer results of more specific in this area. So when I said to look at the number of times an article has been cited versus the year of publication. So you see this first article that comes up, it was published in 2016 and it's been cited by three people. And you can look at those articles to see what has been said about this original publication. So that's an interesting way of looking forward from one article looking forward from what they've said. The other thing to look at is the, the journal title will tend to help you look see in what area is this article being written. So this one's in alternative medicine. Unless my project has any relationship to alternative medicine, I can pretty much say that this is probably not relevant to my research project. Whereas this, this one here, marketing intelligence and planning, you know, I'm a marketer, I have a marketing problem, this one might be re uh, relevant. So it was 2014, it's only been cited two times, mm, maybe. The other thing you can do in these, doing these searches is you can look into the past. 
So here's this one that, you know, I'm not sure whether is that relevant. I can look at the references that this article used. So this is going backwards. If the internet will work. Okay, it's not going to work. Ah, all right, we'll stop that. Just believe me, it does it. Just, it seems to be slow. And then we have ones that have come up with, uh, that are in French. I don't know how your French is, but mine is atrocious. So you can just say English, if that can narrow down your search. So these are all the ways in which the databases can be used. So you can, in these databases, you can also select citations and you can save them with the full text into a document that can be uploaded directly into your qualitative analysis software. So both QDA and Invivo allow you to upload a list of citations with the associated text into their software so you can then easily run your um, analysis on that. So this is the library databases or ProQuest in particular. Now I need to go back to here. So, so just to reiterate, so why do a literature review? So we need background information, we need to clarify the research problem and questions, we need to reveal whether information already exists, help define important constructs of interest, so is consumer commitment actually relevant and, and important to the study that I want to do, and it can also suggest sampling and other methodological approaches that have been successful in studying similar topics. So for instance, if you're looking at perceptions of taste and you want to see if something tastes good or people like the taste of something, there will be other studies done on taste and you can look at the methods that they've used and simply replicate those methods. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. So in terms of building the conceptual framework, this is your thinking about the topic. So this is your system of concepts, your assumptions, expectation, beliefs, and theories. I have put a reading onto Wattle, or you can use the link embedded in the slides to see what is meant by a conceptual framework. I myself like to draw a mind map of the concepts that I think are important and how I think they relate together. So the advantages of secondary data over primary data. So secondary data, there is a lot of information av available and with the advent of search technologies and the internet, this availability has only increased and is steadily increasing. So the cost associated with secondary data for a lot of sources is minimal, but if you're using a, a, a company generated report from say Nielsen, it can be quite expensive. On the other hand, primary data acquisition can take a long time, it can be quite expensive, and the scope of primary data collection is essentially very narrow. So it's answering a sp very specific question because that's the nature of the methodology. And, but what it can do is answer that specific question, whereas secondary data, because it's created for some other purpose, may not be as specific in its ability to answer a question. So the limitations of secondary data is that there's prior data manipulation, which you may or may not be aware of, and the reliability of the original source of the data is uh, may be unknown. So we have issues around relevancy, around time, the categories of the, the definitions, and the unit of measures. So when Pornhub was using the city of Cleveland, where was it setting 
the boundaries of Cleveland? And how did it decide whether someone lived in Cleveland or not? And finally, the data accuracy, the trustworthiness of that data. So if it's consistent across sources, then we can generally say that um, the data is accurate. However, if multiple sources are simply repeating an inaccurate original um, data, then it gives a false sense of accuracy. So there's always questions in secondary data about the credibility and appropriateness of the original source that collected and analysed the data. So planning, it's the same approach. We have goals, we have objectives, we specify our characteristics, we outline the specific research activities. So in this stage, it's are you going to use Google? Are you going to use Google Scholar? Which library databases are you going to use? What search terms are you going to use? How are you going to specify your data search? Are you going to limit it to full text only? Are you going to limit it to English language only? These procedures need to be documented because you will need to report them as part of your reports. Once you've got the data, you need to establish the reliability. So looking at the source versus citation, number of citations, um, looking from the past and into the future. And then looking at the data itself. What kind of method was used? How big was the sample size? What kind of procedures were used to analyze the data? Were they appropriate? And finally, document using tabulation mechanisms. So you can create tables of documents, or in our case, we're going to use Invivo or QDA to, to do a lot of this tabulation for us. So the internet, again, has made it more accessible, but with the rise of fake news, the reliability and accuracy of that data is always, always under question. So that is all for this lecture. So we have discussed secondary data, sources of secondary data, how to search for it. And in the workshops this week, we're going to look at how to analyze it. So I will see you guys soon.